This evening we are kicking off a brand new teaching series titled The B Factor. And when we think about this series and the inspiration for this is, is that um, God has requirements for each of us. That God has an ideal for who we are to be, for how we're to know Him and how we're to follow Him. And the good news about this is, is that God has not left this to guesswork. He hasn't left it to the feelings of emotion or experience or even intellectualism. God has gone to great lengths to write into history His precepts for peace in this life and in the life to come. Now why this is significant is that knowing what God requires of you and what God has for you provides a great sense of spiritual structure, something that is needed, as well as secure footing for knowing where you stand with God. Now there's many places in the Bible that you can look and to see what does God require of us, but there's one place in particular, and it's where we're going to journey over these next few weeks, where this thought of what good does God require of me. And it's a book in the Old Testament, and it's Micah. And it's not necessarily a familiar book, but maybe that's one of the reasons why we need to do it. The book of Micah, it is written by the prophet Micah. And it's written around 722 B.C., about 700 years prior to the birth of Christ. What's significant about this book is that God is at work with his people, the people of Israel. At this point in history, God has through a number of events has divided the kingdom of Israel into two subdivisions, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Here, Micah is addressing both kingdoms, but he's especially focusing on the southern kingdom. And his book can be broken down into three phases. And I want you to take notice of this in the notes because it's important to the context of our study. Micah could be broken down into understanding it this way, that God through Micah is talking about judgment for injustices. That there was a lot of injustice going on in Micah's day. And that's usually what God's prophets would do, is they would speak and bring warnings to things that were going on that were not good, that were not healthy. Events and actions that were taking place that were actually leading people away from God, not to God. And so we see here in the book of Micah, judgments for injustices. And we're going to talk about those in just a moment. But then here's the good news about the Bible and about this book. Is that even though God will bring judgment, there's always re restoration after the judgment. And see, isn't that like a good parent? A good parent will never let his children or her children run amok and not do anything about it. Because a good parent's going to step in. And there's going to be consequences. There's going to be judgment. And then afterwards, of course, and through the whole effect, there's love. And so God, even though he does judgment, God also brings restoration and love. You know, personally, I'm thankful for God's judgment in my own life. Imagine if we were never convicted of anything we'd never done wrong. Imagine if we were the boss of our own life and we were our own conscience. Well, we would make a mess of things. I got news for you. We probably wouldn't be a church. There would have been nobody at the 11 o'clock service and there was a good crowd there. There'd be nobody here tonight. We got a crowd here. There'd be nobody at church because you know what? We're in control and we, we can rationalize the stupidity that we do till the cows come home, as the saying goes. But God brings judgment for good reasons. But then he brings restoration. And Micah talks about that. But where we want to focus on is this third theme of this book. And that is that God provides clear requirements for how we're to know and follow him. And so these requirements come in the context of political dismay. You had political leaders and religious leaders robbing the other people in this area in the southern kingdom. God had blessed and promised so many things, but yet people were still scheming, getting over on their family, getting over on their friends, and anybody else they could. And God is stepping in and saying, that's not what I've blessed you to do. I haven't blessed you to take advantage of the poor, or the weak, or those with diseases. I haven't put you in positions of leadership so that you can get over on people. And so God steps in, and he says, in essence, this is what I want you to be about. This is what I saved you to be about. And I believe that's applicable to us today. We need to know exactly what God requires of us. In fact, there's a key verse here. It's found in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. 
and it's on the screen and why don't you just uh, find your place there on the screen and um, obviously you can follow along in your Bibles or on your mobile device but this is what it says in Micah 6 8 and let's say it together this evening let's say it he ha has he told you O man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now we're going to wrestle with the last part of that verse over the next three weeks, but tonight we're going to focus on what does it mean to do justice? And in essence, we're going to tackle the question of what does God require of us? Now, when it comes to trying to understand what God requires of us, I believe there's a lot of misconception. And a lot of that misconception may have kept you from coming to church for a while. Or maybe right now that you're dealing with misconceptions of what God requires of you and it's actually getting in the way of you living for God. Well, one of the common misconceptions is, is sometimes people think, well, I need to be perfect. Um, that's what God requires of me. But the Bible doesn't say be perfect uh, because God knows we're not going to be perfect. Now, we could pursue perfection even though we'll fall short. We've already fallen short. We could pursue holiness because God is holy but we'll never attain it. But God doesn't say you, that's not a requirement that you need to be perfect to follow him. Another one that people think is they'll go, well, I need to be, I need to be somebody, you know, I need to be this spiritual giant and save the world. Well, nobody's going to save the world. Start in your own home. Start loving your own family. I bet you they've been wanting you to do that for a while. You know, start right there in being responsible. But I believe, and you can write this down, the, the, the most common misconception of what people think that God requires of them is to be religious. Oh, in order to come to church, in order to follow God, you got to be religious. Well, that's not true. The last thing you want to do is be religious because religion will sabotage your relationship with God. You don't want to be perfunctory when it comes to God. You don't just want to spit verses out and be a robot and adopt this life. You, know, you want to be real with God. You want to be real with people. In fact, uh, you know, it's hard to believe the gift wrapping will be in three months, but I remember last year we were doing the gift wrapping and it's wrapping somebody's gifts and I invited them to church and they said, well, Ray, I would love to come, but I'm really not the religious type. And I leaned over the table and I said, dear, that's good because I'm not religious either, okay? And the last thing you want to do is be religious. You want to be the person God created you to be and you want your relationship with him to be vibrant, to be fresh. But this thought of thinking we have to be religious to please God and that's what God requires is nothing new. In fact, if you have a Bible and um, it'll be on the screen, you can go to Micah chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1 here. What's interesting about Micah chapter 6 and where we'll spend our time this evening is that Micah chapter 6 actually draws a, a net over the previous five chapters and draws it all in. As we approach chapter 6 verse 1, God is speaking through Micah. And it's almost as if God is this parent who has done a lot for his children, everything for his children, but his children do not live for him. Think about that as a parent. You know, you do everything for your child and you provide for them. You know, you provide a house for your child. You provide cooked meals, home cooked meals for your children. Okay? You know, you wipe your children when they were younger and clean them. And I bet you they made a couple of doozies in their day, okay? You do laundry three times a week for your children. And then to have them not obey and not follow the rules of the home would be like a slap in the face. And as God speaks here in Micah chapter 6, it's that. God is reminding them of the great lengths he's gone to to bless them. And because they're not living a certain way, God is going to come out of this and say, well, this is what I require of you. And Micah is God's megaphone here. And so this is what God says through Micah. Hear what the Lord says. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Plead your case before the mountains and let... The hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord. And you enduring the foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people. And he will contend with Israel. And this is what God says. Oh my people, what have I done to you? In other words, what haven't I done for you? Anything you've needed, I've blessed you with. And God's going to bring the whole history in here. How have I wearied you? How have I been a burden to you? In other words, God is saying, I've taken the burden out of your life. I've brought rest. Remember Jesus would say, come to me, everyone who's burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's what God's saying here. He's saying, I've taken your burden away. I've carried your burden. 
He says, answer me. Let me know. It's almost like, again, a parent having a conversation with a child who's walking in a different direction. Everything that they could ever want is right there before them. And now God's going to give them a little redemptive, remember-type history right here. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Now, if you remember from our series that we just went through the Ten Commandments, we spent ten weeks going through the Ten Commandments. So what did I say a number of times? God will often in the Old Testament revert back and look back to what took place in Egypt. And so will the people of God because it was that important of an event. It was a miraculous event of God's provision and his salvation, of a reminder of his hand of blessing. And here God is saying, have I not taken you out of bondage? I didn't take you out of bondage for you to go back into bondage. I didn't save you from slavery for you to be enslaved to sin. I didn't bless you so you can be selfish. He says, did I not send before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam? These are some of the greatest leaders to ever walk the face of the earth. Moses, without question, is perhaps one of the top three leaders who, have, who has ever lived. You know, a lot of people can lead from a surplus and lead when the going's good and look good for the cameras, even though they didn't have cameras then. But think about what Moses led God's people through. Two million people, he led them out of slavery, stood up to Pharaoh, crossed the Red Sea, and then led the people. Eventually, as we know, they would inhabit the Promised Land, all because of the leadership of Moses. And then Aaron, of course, being a, a lieutenant in that army, if you will, and a great leader. And then Miriam, who actually we have the very first praise song after the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 15. God sent his very best. That's what God's saying here. Have I not delivered you from slavery? Did I not send you the very best leaders that heaven could offer? I provided for you. So I've given you freedom. I've given you salvation. I've given you pastoralship and leadership. And he says, oh my people, even remember Balak, the king of Moab, when he devised and what Balaam, the son of Behor, answered him. And what happened from Shedem to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord, that there was even people trying to conspire against God's people, but God even turned that around. So God is saying, I've gone through great lengths to preserve you and provide for you. And so, now Mike is going to speak on behalf of the people. This isn't Micah's thoughts, but this is what the people are thinking. This is what they're thinking then they have to do. Their conviction is falling upon their heart and they say this. And this is kind of what you and I do when we, when we get caught with our hand in the cookie jar of life. When we're not living for God and we've got to circle the wagons. What shall I come before the Lord? What, what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? So he's making reference here to the sacrificial system. They're thinking they need to do outward sacrifices to please God. With 10,000 rivers of oil, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now, nowhere in the Bible does God condone sacrificing your child. This was actually a ritualistic idolatry practice that was seeping its way into the hearts of the children of Israel as they would offer up their children to the God of Molech. And they would offer their firstborn as a sacrifice. And God never required that. But they're so convoluted in their spiritual beliefs. They're in need for God's judgment more than ever before that they don't even worship correctly. And they're thinking they got to do all these religious duties. See, even way back then, in 722 B.C., people thought God required religious services. And then they say, shall I give the fruit of my soul? And then we have Micah 6, 8 that we read. Has, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And so God doesn't require us to be religious. He requires us with the title of tonight's message is God requires us, and that's what we're going to focus on this evening on justice, to be virtuous. That's the essence of of being a person of justice is that you are virtuous. And so put religion aside. What good is religion if all it is is a system and you're not living it out? What good is quote unquote knowing the Bible if you're not living it out? God is far more interested in you being transformed than you being a person of just information. 
And so as we come to this message and we come to this text, God is stressing the importance of you and I being about loving mercy, about walking humbly with God, and where we're going to look to this evening, about justice. You know, when you think about justice, we have a great need for that in our society today. There is a lack of justice in our society. You know, today as we hear the different candidates for the national presidency office, and we'll have debates, every, a debate every week in October leading up to the election, and then we'll have the national election on uh, November the 6th, and we'll have both of these candidates going back and forth, and everybody wants, and our country usually loves to advance freedom, but I got news for you. You know what our country needs even more than freedom? We need justice. We need justice. We need to do what is right. We need to pursue what is right. And so as we look to this verse, it provides great encouragement and a platform for that. In fact, let's look at the Hebrew word for justice. And we'll have that up on the screen. It's in your notes. The Hebrew word is misfat can you say that with me misfat and that means to do what is right what is fitting what is proper that god says this is what i require of you that you would pursue that which is right that which is holy that which you need to do and so when we think about justice we've never needed it more in our society and we look back to the book of micah there was a misplace of justice and so why does that happen why do we have injustice taking place in our society? Why was there injustice taking place in 722 BC in Micah? And why has that been true all throughout the centuries, even to this very day? Why do we have injustices today when we see in the courts? Why do we have injustices today when we see things take place all over the country and internationally? Well, I want you to write this first principle down. This first principle down provides great direction in this area. Injustice results from the absence of godly standards. When there are no godly standards in a home, when there are no godly standards in your heart, when there are no godly standards in the nation, all hell could literally break loose. And so that's what was taking place here in Micah. There was an absence of godly standards. And when God's standards are not being followed, and what are God's standards? Well, we just studied them for 10 weeks. The Ten Commandments, those were his standards and other things that he said. But when there's an absence of that, you will have injustice. When people are not living and following God, when I'm not living and following God's standards, when there's no standards in my life of God, well, guess what? There's no telling what I'll go back to do. And that's exactly what God was saying here. You've gone back to what I saved you from. You've gone back to being in slavery spiritually. And eventually, he's warning them that you're going to fall to the Babylonians. If you go study history, that's what took place for the southern kingdom. They fell to the Babylonians. The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. Why? Because they were so consumed with, them, with, their, se with their own self and with their own well-being that they were anything but virtuous and they despised justice. In case you've forgotten, these were some of the things that took place in Micah. Here's a couple of examples of the injustice that took place as we go through the entire book. And I wrote a few of them down there in your notes. First, these people had premeditated evil. Listen, you could just wake up one day and somebody, somebody decks you in the face and then, you know, you get back at them or you do something to them and maybe you've responded with self-defense, but then you took it a little too far, far, and now you've repaid evil for evil or something like that, okay? You know, sometimes we have reaction evil where we don't even think about it. We just do it. Somebody says something about us, we say something ten times worse, okay? That's reaction evil. These people had premeditated evil. They were actually laying in their beds, Micah says in Micah chapter 2, premeditating how they could hoodwink and get over on their fellow countrymen. You even had families, brothers getting over on brothers and sisters getting over on sisters. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to take each other's land. God had blessed them with land and they were trying to get over and take each other's land. Politics was corrupt. The religious leaders were corrupt. And so premeditated evil. They stole and they plundered one another. They oppressed the poor. Imagine that. They would oppress the poor. They would do anything they can to squeeze anybody, even the poor. They despised justice and distorted the truth. They accepted bribes. And what you had was you had judges who were put in place to keep justice. 
Even in then, they had primitive ways of keeping justice, but those judges were sellouts because they would accept a bribe and then they would rule even in the guilty party's favor. And so you had the poor losing whatever they had. You had good, hardworking people losing whatever they had. And we see that today, right? You see uh, somebody who was a, a pedophile or go before a judge. There's all the evidence there. And somehow they only get 30 days in jail. And then it comes out later on, uh, the story is the judge, he, he was a pedophile or two. And why was that? He accepted a bribe in his own life. He had injustice. He had no standards. We see that here. But it gets a little worse. They acted in violence and deceit. Micah chapter 3, verse 10 and 6 too. And they even murdered their own people. They even went to those lengths to do that. Now, as we label injustice and we look throughout this book, here's a couple of labels that fits in with injustice. Covetedness. We talked about that last week with the Tenth Commandment. They were coveting one another's possessions and one another's pieces of property and land. They were coveting it, and that drove them to these premeditated actions of evil. Now, as we read these labels, you might say, Ray, I never murdered anybody. Okay, anybody need to kill anybody? No, don't raise your hand. We can talk about that later. Okay. Stole, steal? I don't steal anything. I work hard. You know, I, I'm not like any of these people in Micah. But that's just the point. Just like other verses in the Scripture, you've got to look deeper. These are examples. These actually took place. But in our own heart, we may not have... Stand, there might be missing standards in our life. These were the missing standards in the, the people of the southern kingdom. They were missing these standards, and so this is what took place. What standards of God is missing in your life? Do you cover other things? And maybe it's not to the extreme of premeditated evil, but coveting is coveting. It goes on to say faithless and fearful. That when they were taking from one another, that just showed faithlessness. When you scheme to get what you want, you don't trust God, it just shows a lack of faith. Heartless, when you steal from the poor. Manipulative. Anytime you try to manipulate to get your own way, it's a, it shows a form of injustice. Dishonorable and a sellout. That's the last thing we want to be. You know, think of it in your life. You may not be a judge, but do you have a price? Is there a certain temptation that if it presents itself to you, you will give in? And you have said for years, oh, that's my weakness. That's what I give in to. You know what? I'm reminded of what it says in Philippians, where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so if we have an absence of godly standards in our life, of course we're going to be a sellout when things that come our way that we know we're not supposed to get into, but we get into them. And as we look at this book of Micah, we see that it perfectly applies to our life. That we need to be honorable people and not be a sellout. That we need not to have an absence of the standards of God. That we need to apply God's holy standards. And the last thing we want to do is we, want to, we don't want to be a coward. We don't want to be hate-driven. We want to have standards in our life that we live by. And they might say, Ray, what are some of those standards that we can live by? Well, I summed up the Ten Commandments and a couple of other commands in the Old Testament, New Testament. And I want to give you a few simple commands, a few simple standards to live by, godly standards. Number one, first and foremost, seek to honor God with your life. Let that be a standard. I'm going to honor God whatever, whatever I do in my life. I want to bring honor to God. At work, I want to bring honor to God. I want to bring honor to God at school. I want to bring honor to God in my marriage. I want to bring honor to God in my home. I want to bring honor to God with my words, with my actions, with my finances, with my talents. I want to bring honor to God. That's what I want to do with my life. And a lot of times people get so concerned, and we were talking about this earlier, about spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit. My friends, you know, it's not about getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit getting more of us. That's a correct teaching in the Bible. And so if we want to be Spirit-led people, we got to live according to the Spirit. And we got to be people who live to honor God. That should be the top priority of our lives. And in the book of Micah, that was totally missing. That standard, that was missing. That form of justice was missing. And you can't have justice. You can't do justice if you're not following a just God. Didn't Jesus say, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness? Well, righteousness is a form of justice. God is a just God. And if we're not seeking to live an honorable life, well, then how are we going to be a person of justice? A second standard for us to follow is that I'm going to have a zero tolerance policy for sin. Now think about that for a second. We said this in the early service. 
Whenever you talk about sin in church, people go, oh, I don't want to hear about this. But that's the equivalent of going to a hospital and saying that uh, we don't talk about sick people in the hospital. Everybody's healthy in the hospital. That's ridiculous. Church is the perfect place to talk about sin because that's our Achilles heel. That's our biggest problem. Everybody who's here this evening, everybody who is at the early service, no matter where you sit, down here, up in the balcony, don't matter, Everybody struggles with sin. Everybody struggles in that area, whether they're sins you know you're committing or sins you're not even aware of that you're committing. Fact of the matter is, is that we need to have a zero tolerance policy for sin because that brings honor to God. That should be a standard that we have. And the third standard that I want to recommend is that I'm going to serve God. I'm going to serve God with my time. I'm going to be used of God, whatever it might be. And it might take you a little while to figure out your niche and what you're going to do. But the truth is, is when you give your time to God, that's your most precious commodity, not your money, your time. You, can't, you can make more money. You can't make more time, okay? And so that is your most precious commodity. And when you use it for the glory of God and for his honor, um, that is a very important standard to keep. And those three standards will actually rule out a lot of garbage in our life. When we live to please God and bring him honor, well, we're going to root out a lot of those old nature and those old ways. When we say, God, I'm, I'm going to have a zero tolerance policy for sin, we're not going to get reacquainted with our old self. When we say that we're going to serve God with our time, we're going to be more productive. And justice is so very important. It's what our country needs today. How many of you ever heard of the Pledge of Allegiance? Well, I know you all have. Okay, and here it goes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, I know a lot of people don't like this, under God, indivisible, with liberty and what? Justice for all. We can't have freedom if we don't have justice. And you'll hear these candidates talk till the cows come home about this agenda and that agenda, but yet we need to hear more about Let's do what's right. Let's please the God of justice. That's what our country needs most of all. We need to pursue the justice of God. People are more concerned about tax cuts than they are about the unborn. And that is an issue in this election. All we got to do is listen. As we want to legalize the pill and we want to have all these thoughts about abortion. You know what's a great injustice? That there is approximately 825,000 abortions a year. Since Roe vs. Wade, there has been over 50 million abortions. That's called a holocaust. And what my friend Frank Pravone for Priest for Life said, that if you can't guarantee and predict the life of the unborn, then all bets are off for any form of life. And so we must protect this important area of life. This is a great injustice in our culture today. And I can't tell you who to vote for. They'll take away my 5013C. You want to go out to eat? I might give you a few recommendations. But it's not about a political party. You know what it's about? It's about justice. And we need to pray for both candidates running because people will say whatever they want to do to get elected. And they'll promise you numbers. And, they'll, and, then, and then you listen to some of these speeches and you go, man, that's pretty impossible, you know. And some of these things still haven't come to pass. And, and all these different thoughts. But at the end of the day, we need people to be about justice. God's justice. That's what our country needs. And I thank God for uh, organizations like the ACLJ, J. Seculo, the American Center for Law and Justice. And they have an app. You can download that on your smartphone. Um, and I thank God for organizations like that because we need people to stand up to people like the ACLU. Remember the ACLU? Oh boy, they actually, the ACLU led a lawsuit against a librarian because her crucifix hung out of her blouse while she was signing a book out. They, they found that to be offensive to people. And so they started this campaign to have her fired, the ACLU. And so thank God for the American Center for law and justice. And they fight all types of things. About three years ago, you'll remember that at church, we prayed for a pastor in Iran. Pastor Yushef. He was put in prison because he's a pastor. And they were going to execute him. He has children, a wife, a family. And he was on trial for three years. And just the other day, by the grace of God, he was released. And that is a major, and you can give God a clap for that. I think that is great. 
and the ACLJ, they were involved. Now, Congress actually got involved, and they sent a letter over, and 417 to 1, they passed this right to send a letter over. What I like to know is, I'm going to look it up, who's the one person that voted against this? We need to find out who that is and go tell that district to vote that person out of office, because who would vote against having this man released from prison? I mean, that's just inhumane. But here we have the, the need for justice. That's justice served. And there are people all over the world who are persecuted for the same freedom you have today to come to church this evening. For the people that came to church earlier in the day. And we don't ever want to take our freedoms for granted. And we need to remember that in order to do that, we need to protect the justice. We need to protect what's right. We have to watch out. We have to be on alert. We need to be more concerned. Don't worry about economics. Worry about justice. God will take care of the rest. You know, God sits on his throne and God will provide. There's no doubt about that. Regardless of what anybody will tell you, it needs to be about the justice of God. We need, listen, our country was founded on those principles, but we've gone far away from them. Even people in the church will, will come up with excuses for why something like the unborn isn't important. You might say, oh, Ray, don't talk about abortion in church. There could be people who have had abortion in church. And I've been saying for 10 years that there's great news in Jesus Christ, that if you had an abortion and now you've come to the Lord and maybe you didn't have the right advice, certainly it wasn't spiritual advice, and maybe you were young and impressionable, here's the good news. That child's in heaven and you will be reunited with that child again. That's something to definitely be happy about. And who knows what that child is like, but you'll be reunited. That's a blessing in grace. That is God's grace. And in all of my counseling, I never met one woman or one man that said, you know, I'm really happy that we went through with that. There's regret. And there's pain. That's why there needs to be prayer. And that's why we need to stand up against. This is one of many injustices, but perhaps the greatest one. Because this is the foundation of all injustices. If we can't have a voice for those who don't have a voice, then what's the point in having a voice? That's what true influence is, isn't it? Being a voice for those who don't have a voice. And we may not, we're not taking up a cause and we're not going to go lead a march here for abortion. But we need to care for issues like this. And maybe for some that is your passion and what you're going to be about. But we should make sure that we're about the justice of God and about the things that God is about. And so, when we have an absence of the standards of God, we see that we have a culture that isn't about justice. It's about everything else. And that is dangerous. And that is why we have children learning about sexual activity in kindergarten. I don't want my son to learn about those things unless it comes from me and my wife. Okay? Well, that's, that's an abuse of, of justice. Okay? That's a lack of justice. And the list goes on. And our country begins to erode because there's a lack of justice. And maybe Lady Justice might be on the wall, but we're not following the commandments. We're not following God's standards. And we need to preserve that. You need to pray about that. You need to pray to preserve justice. And so, if injustice is the absence of godly standards, and if we adopt these godly standards and we protect justice, then write this last principle down as we close. Justice, then, is possible by taking a stand for God, with God. Justice is possible. It's possible if we take a stand with God. If we stand for the things that God is concerned about. And it could be anything. It could be anything. You know, your heart might beat for something. You know, God has made you in such a way he has let you go through certain experiences that you've endured for a reason. You know, you might have a care for those with Alzheimer's. Somebody might have a care with somebody with a disease. Again, God will use that. That bad that has happened in your life, God will actually use it for good in due time. And he's calling us to take a stand with him. And isn't this what Jesus said? In Luke chapter 11, Dr. Luke records these words of Jesus. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And this is what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. But woe to you Pharisees. You remember the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They were so concerned about looking spiritual, about getting a pat on the back and 
looking the part, but they weren't living it. And so Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tied mint and rue and every herb. And that sounds like something you put on a salad, actually. But that was, that was something they would harvest, and they would give that over to God, trying to keep the law. But that was all they were doing. He says this, You neglect justice, and you love, and you neglect the love of God. Wow, what, what, a, what a statement from Jesus. You think because you put your little money in or you put your little herbs in and you, you're doing all these religious signs and these religious duties and you think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread but you neglect justice and you neglect the love of God. And he says, these you ought to have done without neglecting others. And see, justice is so important. And that's why God said this through Micah, because people were hurting one another in Micah's day. People were getting over on one another in Micah's day. There was a lack of justice. And anytime there's a lack of justice, there's the absence of God's standards. However, God says this, this is what I require of you, that you would be virtuous, that you would be about justice, that you would take a stand. And so here's the question I have for you as we close today. What is God calling you to take a stand for in your life? What is it tonight, as, as you hear this message, and this was written in 722 B.C., not the message because I'm not that old, but, but these verses, and God has preserved it through the times, and here it is before us this evening. What does God require you to take a stand on in your life right now? How do you need to raise the bar in your own life? Have you been stuck under that thought that God is requiring me to be religious? It's more, much more than that. Because true religion is what? Caring for widows and orphans. So it's much more than just performing duties. But we need to take a stand. And so I wrote some things down that we could take a stand for. And first, I want to focus inwardly on our hearts. We need to take a stand by surrendering a bad habit. If there are things that we're doing tonight that we know are leading us away from the cross, away from God, God says take a stand and surrender that. That is number one important thing to do. You, none of these other things will make sense. You won't even want to do them if you're not willing to take a stand and say, God, I have to honor you. I want to live for you. I want to get rid of these bad habits and adopt some good ones. We take a stand by standing for purity, whether you're married or not. God says this, Jesus actually says this in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Isn't that very important? That you're actually, you're not going to see God moving in your life. You're not going to understand his word if we're not taking a stand for purity. Take a stand by loving your spouse as you promised to do on your wedding day. And all the women smile now, okay? And I said this earlier, you know, I have, I have, I have a, a double reinforcement here because I'm married and I officiate weddings and I'm kind of obligated to do this stuff, okay? Even more so. But all joking aside, marriage isn't easy. It's, it's a tough uphill battle and we all understand that. But take a stand for your home. Take a stand for your spouse because today there's such an attack on the home. You know, I said this earlier in the early service and I'm glad I, glad I, I, rem I remember to say it tonight. You know that actually... In our society today, it's looked down upon to take a stand. It's looked down upon to do justice, to do the right thing. Actually, if you do the right thing, you might be labeled a goody two-shoes. Right? Think about that for a second. If, if you don't take from work and you do, the, you do the, the wrong thing and you get over on somebody, uh, you know, that's okay. But don't do the right thing because you're a Dougley do-right then, right? Justice is actually looked down upon. And this is what our children are growing up in. That's why all the more we need to take a stand, whether it's in a marriage or in a home. The other day we watched uh, Facing the Giants. That's a great movie that I recommend. And I've seen it a number of times, but each time at the end, and I'm not an emotional guy. My, the, hair, the little hairs on my Italian arm, I'm not a very hairy Italian, but the little hairs that I got, they stand up. And I feel like I get saved all over again. Because the father wheels, the guy that's in the wheelchair, his, his son's about to kick the, the game-winning field goal. And he's paralyzed and he wheels his wheelchair over. And somehow with the help of the fence and the positioning of the chair, he pulls himself up and he's barely standing. And he gets his arms up because that's the signal you make when a field goal is good. And somebody comes over to him and says, sir, could I help you? He says, leave me alone. I'm standing for my son. And I thought as a parent that was very powerful. Because maybe there's been times in your life that you may have felt like a loser or this or that. But my friends, if you have stood for your children... How honorable is that? How precious is that? God looks upon that with great 
with great admiration. When you stand for the people you love. When you stand for them and you do no matter what for them. Take a stand for the people you love. Take a stand for your children. Take a stand for making God your top priority. If anything else is in place of God, you need to listen. It might, it might be good, but just move and over it around. Let God be your top priority priority. Now outwardly. As we do that inwardly, let's go outwardly. Take a stand for the unborn as we talked about earlier. Take a stand for those who are persecuted. Take a stand for the mistreated. Take a stand for the widows. Take a stand for the orphan. Take a stand for the poor. Take a stand for the abused. Take a stand for the youth. Take a stand for the memory of a loved one who passed away with a disease. Take a stand for what concerns you. See, God has wired you in such a way your heart might break for an abused child. Perhaps God is calling you to do something for that. You, your heart might break for a homeless person or a broken home marriage or whatever it might be or a widow, an orphan. It might be a disease that your family went through. HIV, cancer, Alzheimer's, whatever it might be, God is calling you in your lifetime to take a stand. To operate on those godly standards of doing justice and caring for those who are no longer in a position to care perhaps for themselves. That is why we're going to launch our organization, Voices for Hope. And you'll hear about that in a few weeks when we celebrate our anniversary as a church. That the church will launch into a 10-year vision to be hope and to be a voice of hope for those for whatever reason have lost their voice. We want to take a stand as a church. We've got to take a stand as individuals first. And then most importantly, take a stand for the least of these, just as Jesus did. And this is what God says to do justice. Don't step on people. Help people. You know, there's a difference between somebody laying down and somebody who's been knocked down. And we've got to help people who've been knocked down. And that's what God's called us to do. He's called us to have justice in our own life and pursue what is right. And to live for his honor. Now as we close, I just want to say this, that this isn't easy. It's not easy to live for what is right and to please God. In fact, just this week alone, as this week comes, there's going to be, it's not perfect. There's going to be things that happen that get you down. I mean, everything from getting a parking ticket to having your favorite shirt goes in the dryer and it shrinks to getting a bill. The IRS forgot to charge and here comes a bill. And all these other things that come our way that we don't expect that when they happen, you know, we're just, oh man, life's against me. And those are just tongue-in-cheek issues, but there's even deeper issues that we're going through this evening that are gripping our heart. Perhaps trouble in the home, or trouble in a marriage, or sickness, or whatever it might be, or lack of finances and help. And there are things that we go through, and we need God all the more. And so if we're going to live this out, we're going to pursue what is right, no matter what comes our way. And here's some great recommendation from God's Word. This is what it says in the book of Hebrews. It says, let us set our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. And that is what we need to do because he's the perfect picture of justice. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this evening. And we ask that we would be people of justice, God. That we would be people that would live to honor you with our life. We ask for forgiveness with times that we haven't lived for you and just like the people of Micah's day, our standards were missing. They were MIA. We were living for our own causes and our own selfish pleasures and desires. But thank you that even though your conviction and judgment came, there is still mercy and forgiveness. There's still restoration. We thank you that you've given us clear requirements to be humble with you, to love mercy, to help others, and to do justice. Let us be about justice, God. Let us pray for justice. Let us be concerned with your heart. Let us be concerned for those who don't have a voice for whatever reason. God, for we know that because of this, you've provided great significance if we choose to walk down this road, the road least traveled, the road that nobody else seems to have time for. Lord, today barbecues and bar stops and ball games and everything else seems to be more important than you. And usually, God, we wait for the roof to fall in, to call upon your name and to trust in you. But tonight, God, we ask for strength that no matter what comes our way tomorrow, no matter what pains we carry, no matter what crosses that are on our back this evening, 
and we want to be people who do justice because that's what you require of us that this is a message that you've woven into the history of our faith so we pray for grace as we move forward may we be people who live and honor you may we be people just as Jesus said that we will not neglect justice and we will not neglect loving you we give you thanks and praise for who you are for the blessing of salvation in our life and for the blessings that are to come let us be a blessing Lord God let us be people who do justice who love mercy and walk humbly with you we commit our hearts before you this evening we thank you for your son Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose from the dead we believe that truth with all of our heart we thank you for your peace in this life and the peace to come in the next we commit ourselves before you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit we pray amen